So I'm honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Robert Dunn. Uh, I had the pleasure to share an office next door to Rob when we were both graduate students working on our PhDs at University of Connecticut. Since those days in the early 2000s, Rob has gone on to find success in almost everything he touches. Um, I personally think that is because others while working on his PhD, just to like kind of um, talk about that creativity. He was working on his PhD in ecology, but Rob won the Wallace uh, Stevens Prize in creative writing at University of Connecticut four times in a row. Uh, and that spirit of creativity lives on in his, in his writing, including this book. I think he's up to about seven books now in, in about 15 languages. Does that sound right, Rob? Yeah, that, that's probably pretty close. All right, good. <laughs> but in addition to that, he's had countless articles. You probably run across his name in National Geographic or Wired Magazine. Maybe you've seen him in a documentary. He's run countless awards. Lots of scientific uh, publications across a baffling uh, number of domains. And his list of uh, funded grants is probably the most eclectic that I've ever encountered. Um, he's done this in a lot of places, but mostly while working at professor, teacher, researcher, and beloved colleague at North Carolina State University, where he currently serves as the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor in the Department of Applied Ecology. Rob has the dangerous combination of being smart, creative, and funny. And we're fortunate that he uses those talents as a force for good. And more appropriate to this moment, we are fortunate that Rob is with us tonight to talk about his book. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Robert Dunn. Thanks, Rob. Th thanks so much, Michael. Now I, gotta, I feel like I, I need to be funny tonight, and I don't know if I, it, it's a funny <laughs> talk, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right. um, it's a it's a great pleasure to to speak again um, with the Nat Talk series. Uh, I love the museum and everything that it does. And so, go to the museum, fund the museum, donate donate your time. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful part of your community, and I'm glad to be part of it for these brief windows of time. I'm going to share my slides here. And what I'm going to talk about today is deliciousness and flavor. And I'm going to talk about a, this in the context of a new book with my wife, Monica Sanchez, who Michael also knows um, since enough years ago that I had long, long hair when, when our uh, friendship began. Um, and now it's all just uh, mostly back hair. Uh, but, but so... This book that I'm talking about today really began as a very different kind of book. It began as a book about food and about the ecology and evolution of food uh, in the broader human story. And, and the book began because as a consequence of my eclectic career and my and Monica's very fortunate jobs, we've have to, had the chance to, to travel around the world and sit around tables around the world with people who know and are expert in very different things. And as a consequence of that, we've had this kind of secret look into what chefs around the world think about food, what neuroscientists think about food, what paleoanthropologists think about food, primatologists. And when we first started off, we thought this book would really just be about sharing some of those stories. What is this secret lens on food, this secret lens on deliciousness and flavor? And, and revealing those secrets has long been what's motivated me in writing, that this weird job that I have, um, I often get to see people uh, in moments in which they're finding extraordinary joy in discovery and understanding, but very often that, that's very removed from what people see of science, what people see of, of scholarship in general. And so this book started as an excuse just to think about those things and share those stories. But as we began to write the book, it became clear that there was sort of this bigger idea that was lurking in the book uh, that we hadn't realized that was there. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is that bigger idea. And that bigger idea that I'll, that I'll articulate now and come back to in various forms uh, throughout the talk is that if we look at the big story of, of humans and human, human evolution, or really even the bigger story of animals, 
the flavor and deliciousness are, are important in that story far more often than we think they are. And the reason that they've been neglected is I think twofold. First, they seem a little bit ridiculous. You know, there's so much to study in the world. There's there so many real problems. Why would you study pleasure and deliciousness? Um, but also because flavor and deliciousness sit at the interfaces of a whole bunch of different disciplines. And so there's no field that precisely corresponds to the study of, the, of flavor, evolution, and food. It is sort of at the edge of neuroscience, anthropology, ecology, evolution, uh, the knowledge of chefs, the knowledge of home cooks. And, and so a lot of really obvious ideas have been missed when, when Monica and I started to write this book. And so it became a bigger idea kind of book. And so this is what, what I'll be moving toward as I, as I talk today. But before I get there, I want to back out a little bit, because the truth is what we discovered in writing this book is something that other people already knew. And the people who in some ways seem to have most known it are not scientists uh, or other academics, but instead artists and writers. And so if you look at the long history of artists and writers, they very often put food at the center of stories. And so, for example, if we think about the history of painting, there's this amazing moment in the history of Western painting when, when suddenly religious figures and kings and queens get banished from the forefront. And, and, and where you used to have Jesus, suddenly you have a plum or, or you have a glass of wine and suddenly food is central. And this is actually, it seems boring if we look at these still lives in retrospect, but it's this radical moment when, when pleasure is centered in our story. And so when painters were making this transition, there was a lot going on. But one of the things that was happening was there was the recognition that this pleasure could be um, significant. And so too, it's ephemer ephemerality. And this is also something, um, Michael mentioned my interest in poems. It's also something that's long been featured in poems. And so if you look for poems about pleasure, about food, about deliciousness, about flavor, there are many, many poems in this, in this realm. And I wanted to share just two today, both by William Carlos Williams, that I think that speak to sentiments that I'll, I'll come back to. And the first is this poem, uh, This Is Just To Say, which, which I'll say always reminds me both of plums and, and of sort of university or communal refrigerators. This is just to say, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet and so cold. We, we can relate to this uh, experience of, of going to the communal fridge and looking for this deliciousness that you've remembered but can't find. Or to a poor old woman munching a plum on the street, a paper bag of them in her hand. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand, comforted, a solace of ripe plums seeming to fill the air. They taste good to her. Now I could read many more poems on this theme, but I just wanted to introduce the idea that poets and painters have been tangling with, with these realities because in our book and in my talk today, what we want to do is to revisit the human story with the same attention to flavor and deliciousness that Williams offers the plum. In short, we, we, we consider why it tastes good to her, but also why it matters that it does. And here, interestingly, art sort of anticipates the science that we're talking about. Our argument in the book, which I've already sort of br briefly gone over, is that many of the key transitions in human evolution that flavor played a role. And when confronted with a more delicious food and a less delicious food, our ancestors tended to choose the more delicious food. They chose what tasted good to them and from such choices much follows. In the context of the book, I can, Monica and I consider this argument in the context of a series of mysteries, mysteries of stick tools, of big brains, of fire, culinary traditions, avocados, fermentation, spice use, art, food sharing, and more. These sort of more or less map onto the chapters in the book. And I'm gonna mostly talk about two of these today. Um, if we end up having time or if it comes up in the questions, I'll also come back to fermentation because it's especially fun, it's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, but at the very least, I'll talk about stick tools and culinary traditions. And I'll talk about these two particular mysteries because I think they're emblematic of the broader story that we're dealing with. 
uh, even if stick tools seems like an obscure sort of place to start. In the history of the study of our ancestors and of living primates, one of the questions that primatologists have long occupied themselves with is trying to understand when our ancestors began to use tools and then also when other primate species like chimps use tools to try to get a big picture understanding of what it is that sort of catapults us into a next way of engaging the world around us. And the earliest work in this context was really focused on individual uh, anthropologists who would go out into the field and they would habituate individual primate populations. And so think about Jane Goodall uh, working at Gombe. And then they would study those populations and watch what they did. And in doing that, early primatologists really discovered a whole series of kinds of ways that primates use tools. And so Jane Goodall famously discovered the chimps at Gombe uh, using sticks to harvest termites out of termite mounds and also using sticks to harvest ants. And those two kinds of tool use were very different, different sticks, different ways of using the sticks. And this was learned, it was cultural. What's happened in the last decade is that our understanding of that kind of tool use is fast forwarded dramatically. And what's allowed that to happen is that primatologists have started to put camera traps out in the field. And traps like this record not only uh, still photos, but also video. And so primatologists can study chimp populations, gorilla populations, bonobos, even if those populations are not habituated. And in doing so, they've, they've started to really see all of these kinds of tool use that we, we didn't know anything about even just a decade ago. And the leading group on this in the world are some of my collaborators in Leipzig, this group uh, that you see here, who have a project across tropical Africa with camera traps at more than 32 sites for their chimp populations that they've used to, to really understand tool use. And so, and so what I'm gonna do now is to show you a little video of some of the kinds of tool use that they've documented. Maybe you've seen some of these uh, sorts of tool use, but I suspect a few of them will be surprising. I'll say in advance that one of the kinds of tool use that you'll see here is totally uh, enigmatic. And it's, it's the piling of rocks on top of each other and in, into sort of hollow trees there's no good explanation for this, but, but I, I introduce it just because you, you will see it and it's a pretty conspicuous kind of tool use. And so I'm just gonna play a video here and then I'll be quiet while it plays. You can see the kind of tool use that you're seeing uh, in the font at the bottom of the screen. And so what you'll see first is algae fishing, which was just very recently discovered. This is the mystery. And, and so, as you can see, really very impressive and much more varied than we thought um, even quite recently. And, and there, I mean, I could have played an hour long version of this. Um, and so the, the question here, I mean, there are multiple questions that emerge, but one of the questions is, why did chimps use tools so often? Why do they use particular tools? And why did our ancestors begin to use tools? What is it that motivates this use? And I think this is particularly interesting in the context of thinking about the variation in tool use even um, among chimpanzee populations. And so we know that uh, different chimp populations use different tools to do different things. And so this, for example, these two maps show uh, populations of chimps where tools are used to gather ants and termites respectively. And so you can see two things here. One is that both behaviors are very common, but you can also see that, that neither behavior is universal. 
And even these maps hide a lot of diversity because the ways in which the chimps use tools at different sites for ants or termites are super different. And so there's this, this really extraordinary diversity. And so what's going on here? Why do they do it? And we can think about the why do they do it in the two versions. One is, you know, why do modern chimps do it? But also if we're looking at chimps and we know that chimps are a lot like our common ancestor with chimps, why did our ancestors begin to do it? And we can, we can think about this in the context of an evolutionary tree. What you're seeing here is an is a evolutionary family tree that shows humans and our living relatives. And so you've got Pan, which is chimps and bonobos, gorillas, Pongo is, is uh, orangutans, and then Halobates is gibbons. And if we look at this tree, um, what we see is that gorillas and orangutans both use tools, but, but quite rarely, in fact, extraordinarily rarely, versus chimps and humans that, that use tools very often. And we infer that the common ancestor of chimps and humans uh, would also have oops, used tools, but we don't really know quite when this happened, but, but, but we, it seems very likely that our common ancestor used these tools. And so how do we study that ancestor's tool use and why it began? One way to do this is we can actually find ancient tools and study those tools. And so these, for example, are ancient termite um, sticks. These are actually made of bone, not of stick, uh, not of wood, but they were, they were, appear to have been used nearly identically to the ways in which chimps use termite sticks. And some of these are 1.2 million years old, some are 2 million years old. And so, so this is really very ancient evidence of tool use of the kind we see in chimps. And so we could study tools like these, but the problem is there are very few of them. And, and, and they don't tell us very much. You know, they, they give us this window, but it is a, is a foggy window, a misty window, a dirty window, uh, and it is very narrow. And so we, we can only say so much. The easier thing to do is to study ancestral tool use by looking at the ways chimps use tools and then think about what that might mean for our ancestors. And so that's what's far more often done. And that's what I'll talk more about today. And so the question, we can we can frame. Sorry, I'm having a fight with Zoom here that you don't see. Um, in this context, is why did our ancestors in innovate stick tools? And the standard answer to this that's repeated again and again in the scientific literature is that they did so to get more calories, to feed their ever larger brains, brains that require a lot of energy, which is to say to optimize. And scientists, when thinking about choices that mammals make, use this phrase all the time: optimize. But when Monica and I were writing the book, the thing that's really curious about this is if you look at how we talk about other humans, you know, we almost never imagine that humans optimize. Like if you think about when you go to the grocery store and you choose among the foods, do you optimize caloric intake? Do you optimize your nutrition? Uh, almost never. And, and so it's, it's fascinating that we imagine that a chimp optimizes. And so what is it that we imagine about their brains that we don't see in ourselves? And so this seems not quite right. And so Monica and, and I, as we begin to talk more about this, the other option here is that our ancestors weren't optimizing, but instead that what if they use stick tools to get to more tasty foods and that those foods then happen to have more calories. And so tool use using individuals tended to benefit. And so this is very similar as an idea but, but it's, it's simpler in the sense that it assumes not that the chimps know everything that they need and that they're thinking, how do I get you know, 10 more calories today? But instead that they're just thinking, what is delicious? They're looking for delicious things. And then on average, that tends to reward them for what they need. And so, and so it doesn't seem so radical and yet it has some interesting implications. Uh, but how would we think about whether this was true? To, to, to walk through this, I need to give, give you a kind of quick refresher about flavor and deliciousness, because scientists use the words associated with flavor and deliciousness a little bit differently than we tend to use them in our everyday lives. And so the, the ways in which I'll use these terms today are as follows. Uh, so taste is really a sensation confined to uh, the taste receptors on the tongue and, and the sensations they trigger. So it's sweet, it's sour, it's umami, it's bitter, uh, it's maybe kukumi, which we could talk about later. 
but it's really, it's those sensations. Mouthfeel is the texture in the mouth. And interestingly, chefs take mouthfeel very uh, seriously. It's a super important part of how chefs see the world. Scientists have not taken it very seriously, I think because it seems silly, but it, it turns out to be quite important. Aromas are then the part uh, of all of this that we smell. It's what goes up through the nose but it's also what goes from the tongue up to the back of the nose. And so aroma has this, these two parts. Chemisthesis is a word that almost nobody knows, but we experience it all the time. It's the sensation of spicy food or of, of cool food, like uh, chili peppers or mint. Totally different receptors, different system, uh, very distinct from taste. And then flavor is all of these things together. And so to say something has a, a good flavor really is, is a complex sentiment. And actually more things go into flavor too. The sound of a food is part of flavor. Pringles has, has, has realized that the, the sound of even opening the container that contains food is part of flavor. And so flavor is holistic, but it's made up of these pieces. When we think about what chimps are looking for, we actually think one of the most important parts of all this is probably taste. And so we think they're pursuing taste and that they're doing it using their stick tools. But how could we know? Now, I need to back up even a little bit more to explain how we could know. I need to think about a time, I need you to think about a time, uh, not, a, not the time of our common ancestors with chimps, but instead a time when our ancestors were in the ocean. It was in the ocean that most of the sort of physical realities of our bodies evolved. Our cells evolved in the ocean, our backbones evolved in the ocean. Most of what makes us uh, sort of uh, animalian evolved in the ocean. And it evolved in the ocean in the context of those things that were common in the ocean uh, relative to those things that were rare. And so what this figure shows, the, the x-axis, the horizontal axis here, shows the relative commonness of different elements in ocean water. And so you can see oxygen very common here, far over at the right, cobalt not so common. And what the y-axis shows, that vertical axis, is the percent by mass of those same elements in human tissue. Now, the truth is, I could have shown this for humans, for fish, for dogs, that it's basically the same. But what you'll see is that things that are common in the ocean are common in our bodies. And that's because evolution worked with what it had. When our ancestors were evolving in the ocean, it made much more sense for natural selection to favor individuals that, that could make a body work given those things that were common. And so totally reasonable. What was evolutionarily unreasonable is that when our ancestors dragged their fat bodies up onto shore, suddenly they confronted a landscape in which what was common became rare. And this was, this was trouble in general, but it was especially trouble for any vertebrates that would eat a diet that was slightly omnivorous. Because it turns out that plants have a composition that's extraordinarily different in terms of elements from what's common in the ocean. And so this figure, which is kind of messy, but I'll walk you through it, shows one aspect of this. And so the horizontal axis here shows the um, the percent by mass of a set of common elements in animals. And the, the different symbols are different elements and they're color coded by fish, mammals, or insects. But if you look at the black circles, that's the average across all of these groups of animals. The y-axis here shows the percent difference between plants and animals. And so what you see is that sodium, so salt, for example, is about 4,000% more common uh, in animals than it is in plants. And, and so this is a major issue if you're an animal. How do you get that much more salt? Well, what we think and what we've argued in a number of papers is that our taste receptors evolve in essence to reward us for finding those things that are rarer in our bodies 
than they are in sort of a random sampling of those things that we might eat. And so salt taste receptors reward animals for finding salt, which can be very, very rare. This P down here, well, let's go to, to N first. So N is nitrogen. And nitrogen also much more common in, in animals than in plants. And umami taste receptors, which are associated with savory tastes, reward animals for finding nitrogen. And then you get a couple of weird things here. Well, what about phosphorus and calcium, P and CA? They're much more common in animals than in plants, but we don't have a phosphorus or calcium taste receptor. It actually turns out we do have phosphorus and calcium taste receptors. They were just discovered a few years ago. We don't really know how they work, but, but they would be predicted on the basis of what our body needs. And so it seems like they're doing some sort of magic in our tongue that we don't quite understand. And, and so th these are all aspects of how taste is guiding uh, humans, how it's guiding terrestrial animals in general. And taste is really what helps a raccoon or a chimp or a human know what to choose. And so a raccoon doesn't have to call, crawl into a trash can and think about its optimal diet. It can just get in there and think about what tastes good. And in the trash cans of our own lives, that's often what we're doing today. And so we can map our taste receptors onto this plot. The one that's a little bit different here is the sweet taste receptor. Because if you look at plants and animals, the carbon in plants and carbon in animals, it's, it more or less matches. There's some complexities there. But we need carbon not just for building cells, just for building, rebuilding our bodies. We also need it for energy. And so sweet taste receptors re reward us for finding ever more energy to fuel our daily actions. And this slide is just here because I, I think not everybody knows what umami is, but umami is the savory taste. And so it's long been known in, in uh, Japanese cuisines. And, and it was only relatively recently that it became clear that this was one of our fundamental tastes. And so MSG is actually pure umami. There's nothing wrong with MSG. If you want to taste pure umami, sprinkle a little bit, a little of MSG on your favorites of certain salty food, and it's delicious. You will love it. The other set of taste receptors that we have that are a little bit distinct are bitter and sour. They don't reward us for finding things that we need. They reward us for avoiding things that are potentially dangerous. And bitter taste receptors are really quite different in, in that uh, most of the sort of uh, the taste receptors that lead us toward food, they send one signal. There's just one salt and there's one receptor that finds salt in, when, in your food and sort of sends that signal to your brain. You found it, it's good, all is well. But bitter is different. We have 25 different bitter taste receptors but they're all wired to a single sensory perception. And so the bitter of hops and the bitter of coffee are not different, they're identical. If you didn't have the other uh, aspects of flavor, you couldn't tell hops and coffee apart. They just send the signal of bitter. And bitter evolved just to warn us away from things that could be deadly. And bitter taste receptors are very different in different species because what's deadly to one species is different from what's deadly to another. And they're even different from different human populations. And so whether or not you find Brussels sprouts to be bitter depends on which version of a particular taste receptor, TAS2R38, you have. And so bitter is kind of related to the other taste, but doing its own thing. Sour is a totally different kind of taste. I can come back to it in the end if there's time. And until we began writing a paper on sour this year, there was not a single paper ever published on why sour taste exists, not a single paper, which is kind of amazing. But so going back to the chimps, if tool use is about taste, the foods that chimps get with tools should be tastier than those that are otherwise available. But how would we possibly figure this out? Well, the, the good news is if we look at the taste receptors of chimps and humans, they're remarkably similar. And so, and so they seem to be the same or similar for sweet, for sour, for salty, and umami. And what this means is that, that if we taste something and it tastes good, it almost certainly also tastes good to a chimp. The, the exception to this is bitter, the things that are bitter to a chimp are not the same things that are bitter to us. And so at least in theory, this means that somebody could run after a chimp, eat everything that it, eat, it eats, 
and then see if the things that it eats on a daily basis taste worse than the things that it eats using a stick. Fortunately, this is one of the favorite hobbies of primatologists. And so primatologists have spent many years running after chimps and biting into the things that the chimps throw down after eating one or two bites out of them. And so for example, uh, Professor Toshisana Nishida, who started working on chimps at about the same time as Jane Goodall, same year even, uh, spent many years following a group of chimps uh, at Mahale National Park, and in doing so, tasted everything that they ate. Um, and just for context, which becomes relevant later, Mahale is very, very close to where Jane Goodall was doing work. In fact, 70 kilometers, the chimps could actually get from one to the other, at least in theory. And so what Nishida found was a kind of a Yelp ranking for the chimp foods. And as I already noted, things that are bitter to Nishida, but not might or might not be, be bitter to the chimps. They don't tell us very much. But the rest of this pie chart does. And so what this pie chart says is that a lot of what chimps are eating is sweet. Some is sweet and sour, some is sour. And then there's stuff that's bland. You know, humans eat bland stuff when they don't have a choice, chimps do too. And then there are astringent things. Astringent is a whole different part of flavor. We could come back to it later, but it's essentially the puckering that you get from uh, some wines, for example. It's actually a drying out of the salivary glands. And so th this looks as though the chimps are looking for tasty things. And what Nishida found was that the sweetest fruits, fruits were most preferred. They were going toward the good tasting things, both by the chimps and by Nishida. But even the sweets weren't very sweet. On average, Nishida found the foods of the chimps to be at best a bit bland. In contrast, the food procured with the sticks were and are all tastier, and they also are all eaten by humans. And so everything that chimps eat with a stick, humans in the same regions and elsewhere around the world also eat. And so the ants that chimps eat are also eaten by humans. And so they eat lots of chromatogaster ants. I've eaten chromatogaster ants. I'm sure Michael's eaten chromatogaster ants. Um, you can eat some in California. They're sour, they have a nice mouth feel, a little bit of a crunch, they wiggle on your tongue, delightful. Um, the chimps eat seaweed, humans eat seaweed, it has new mommy taste, they eat honey, uh, they eat lots of honey, humans eat lots of honey, it's, it's very sweet and delicious, they eat termites, human loves, humans love termites, and they eat fatty nuts, and the same nuts that the chimps eat, humans eat, and in fact the chimps and humans have long competed for those nuts, and so it looks like all the things that the chimps eat with sticks are in fact tastier than what's otherwise available. And so taste could be important here. But if taste is the guide rather than optimization, modern apes might be expected to sometimes eat things that taste good, but don't benefit them. Does that happen? And so, so this to me is a really intriguing question. And so Monica and I spent lots of time talking to primatologists about this. And it turns out that it happens all the time. And so one of the, my, my favorite examples is, is ant eating. It's incredibly common and chimps spend lots of time eating ants and yet there appears to be essentially no nutritional benefit to eating the ants. Many studies have looked at this and Nishida and others have concluded that they're simply snacks. The chimps don't really digest much of the ant exoskeleton. They just eat them because they taste good. Another example, Dr. Victoria Etienne, who was at the Max Planck Institute, was studying chimps in Gabon at a site called Luongo. And chimps at Luongo take these giant pole-like sticks and they pound into the ground like they're making fufu or something to get to these uh, ground bee nests that can be six feet underground. And so Vittoria was trying to figure out what do they get from this? How much is it worth? And how much time do they spend getting to those nests? And, and so what you would predict nutritionally is, is that they wouldn't spend that much time because how much energy could they possibly get from these nests? But if it didn't take too much energy, maybe they would do it because they would get their optimal caloric reward from getting these to these hives. What Vittoria found is that the chimps sometimes dig for months or even years to get to these nests. And that when they do, they get no more than about a half liter of honey. So it's about 2000 calories. And typically 
this sort of chimp rule of sharing means that whoever happens to be around them when they get to the hive, get some of the honey. And so imagine you've worked several years to get this honey. It's, it's about half a liter and you've got to share it with whichever chump happens to be around. There's no way this is optimal. They do this because the honey is delicious. Another example, Maureen McCarthy and Jack Lester have long studied chimps in East Africa and Uganda. Um, in Budongo and Bugoma, both of which are forest reserves, but also in the habitat between the reserves where the chimps can sometimes live in forests, uh, but also sometimes take advantage of the adjacent habitats. And they found a population of chimps that had actually more or less moved into sugarcane fields. And even though there was adjacent forest, they would just eat sugarcane all day. Essentially, it's their entire diet. And so they eat sugarcane, and they eat sugarcane, and they eat sugarcane. And then when they're done with that, they eat jackfruit, maybe they eat a lemon. And Maureen and Jack have concluded that it's very unlikely that this much sugar is good for the chimps. And they're just doing this because it's super tasty. Another example, this one I really like, this is a fruit um, whose name I never pronounced right, but let's go for it, Penta di Plandra Brasiana. And it was discovered a number of years ago that this fruit tastes very sweet, but it has basically no sugar. And it tastes sweet, because as Elaine Guevara at Duke University has shown, that it essentially has a protein that tricks the taste receptor. The taste receptor looks like a kind of bucket. The bucket has evolved so that sugar goes in the top. It triggers a little part of the receptor. You know, the, the, like a video game, the bell rings, the signal goes to the brain. Well, this fruit has evolved to produce a teeny tiny protein that, that goes around to the elbow of this taste receptor, triggers it, the taste receptor sends a signal to the brain, it's sweet, all is good, keep eating. The advantage to the fruit for doing this is that it has to produce very little of this protein to, to trigger a sensation of extraordinary sweetness. And so the, the plant can make tons of these fruits with very low energy. And almost all African primates, including humans, are tricked by this. And so humans love these. Um, chimps love them, bonobos love them, but gorillas don't. And so the question that Elaine was really interested in is why don't gorillas love these fruits? They like lots of other fruits. In fact, they eat tons of fruits. They find great pleasure in fruits. And the geographic range, at least of the, the Western gor gorilla, overlaps with the fruits. And so what's going on? Well, what Elaine was able to show is that the gorillas, it evolved a version of the receptor that was in essence resistant to that protein. Its little elbow changed. And she was also able to show through some sort of genetic uh, wizardry that whenever that change evolved, that it was so beneficial that, that the individuals with that different version of this receptor were much more likely to survive. Well, so how would this happen? What Elaine thinks is that some of the gorillas like the false leaf fruit sweet so much, false leaf sweet fruit so much that their health suffered. They basically were sitting under the trees, eating these fruits and not getting enough calories. Others like them less. The latter gorillas are more likely to thrive and reproduce. It is only their descendants that survive. And, and so this is evidence of an ancient mistake that gorillas were making with regard to sweetness. It, it is a clear indication of, of the mistakes that taste leads uh, individuals to make. And then of course, if we think about our own lives, we make this mistake all the time. I've been in Denmark for a while. I just came back to see American stores and, and I'm, I'm gobsmacked by the, the cereal aisle, the extraordinary, diversity of forms that we've made sugar take and the ways in which we're fooled by this to imagining this is what we need because our, our dumb tongues keep telling us it is still sweet eat more of it you will be so pleased and we go back and we get uh what's what's a good one mini wheats little bites and and think we're doing a good thing we're not optimizing they're not optimizing we're led by our tongues <laughs>
Another way to think about some of these aspects of flavor and evolution and taste um, in a way that's pretty central to our ancestors and to who we are relates to culinary tradition. In our own lives, culinary traditions are so important. We have the traditions of what our families eat, of, of what our cultural communities eat. And if we look globally, I think one of the most beautiful things about human diversity is the diversity of things we have learned to make and eat. And, but where does this come from? Well, most indications is that, are that the, these traditions have very ancient origins. And we see this in part because when we look at chimps, we see that chimps actually have culinary traditions. If we go back to the tool use, what we see is that different populations of chimps use tools to eat different things. And they, and they use tools, even when they eat the same thing, they often do it in different ways. And so for example, we think about Gombe National Park and Mahali Mountain National Park. In the 1960s, when Goodall and Nishida were studying chimp populations in these two places, what they saw was that in both places, the chimps were eating ants. And so this seems the same. But what they also saw was that they were eating different ants. And so at Gombe, the chimps were eating chromatogaster ants, beautiful ants, uh, you know, lovely and lovely tasting. They were also eating army ants. At Mahali, they were eating carpenter ants, Campanotis ants. And this looked to be just a cultural difference. The same ant species are present at both sites, but the chimps had learned to eat different ants. And what's amazing is that all these years later, so it's, it's now, I mean, go near, it's uh, 54 years since these first studies, the, the chimps at these still two sites are still eating different ants. Those are their culinary traditions. And so how does this emerge? And how does it emerge pre-verbally? This to me is a fascinating question. It's fascinating in the context of chimps, but it's also fascinating if you think about human ancestors moving out of Africa, out around the world, that this was an extraordinary primate journey because for the most, pri for the most part, primates are homebodies. They don't move, they stay in their habitats. But our ancestors at some point start to move. And as they do, they move into from tropical rainforests to deserts, to tundras, to the subarctic. And at each place they encounter new animals and plants to eat. How do they learn what to eat? And how do they do this initially, even before they had words, even before they could verbally communicate? And so, so this is a question that's gone largely unaddressed. And so we started to consider it. And the, the things people talk about is that, well, maybe there are genetic differences in taste or smell. Certainly there are some. And so this could be part of it. So you would actually adapt to your new landscape and culinary traditions are associated with that adaptation. But it could also be that there's a learning component that somehow we learn to enjoy certain elements of the flavors, this composite sensory experience in new places. But how do we do that? How do you do it pre-verbally? What it seems as though is going on here based on the work of neuroscientists, neurogastronomers in particular, is that it, this is all about the learning associated with smell. And smell has these two components that I alluded briefly to earlier. Smell can be orthonasal. This is what dogs mostly focus on. It is the world that comes up through the nose. So dogs exhale air, that bounces little particles up. Those particles then are sniffed in they go up into the nose and they're smelled. And the dog's head, it, the, the shape of its nose, the location of its brain, is really perfect for this orthonasal smelling. But the other way that we can smell, that dogs smell, is retronasal. And so when this guy is eating this sloppy burger, he is experiencing orthonasal smell. He's smelling those sesame seeds. That are, that, oh, their aroma is going up through his nose but he's also experiencing retronasal smell, which in humans is actually far more important. Retronasal smell is the smell that happens when the molecules of that food go through the mouth and up into the back of the nose. And so if we look at a human head, you know, if we have a piece of cheese on our tongue, it's actually being smelled to a much greater extent than what's held in front of our nose. 
And so that retronasal smell is really very important to us. Really interesting thing about smell is that the olfactory lobe of the brain associated with smell is really at the base of the brain and it's really directly connected to smell. And so smell is really a very integral and mysterious part of the brain's workings. Why this is relevant is that neuroscientists have learned that smell is very directly connected with learning and a number of kinds of learning. And so to introduce how this works, I have to introduce uh, a cultural reference that, that if you're my age, you remember, and if you're younger than me, it makes no sense at all, but, but I love it. And so I'll introduce it nonetheless. And it's the reference of a card catalog. This is the Library of Congress's card catalog. And this is what we used to use to find books in the library. And so there would be at least three kinds of cards in the card catalog. There would be subject cards, there would be title cards, and there would be author cards. And often these were then categorized in addition to being alphabetized. And so like things, like, like subjects might be uh, lumped together. And this is what happens with smell. We have a kind of set of card catalogs in our brains associated with smell. So that each time we smell something, that experience receives two cards. One card is associated with something like the title of the experience, a story recorded as a memory. I was eating cheese with my friend in the park and we laughed and the sky was clear. When you remember a smell and, you, and it triggers a memory, this is kind of the card system that's being used, been written about again and again. We've all had this experience. The second card records the subject, cheese. And the more different experiences accumulate in a particular subject, the more finely that second set of cards is divided. Also, the less random the connections among subjects become. And so if you smell lots of cheese, cheeses become divided into hard and soft cheeses, then soft cheeses become divided into blue cheeses, and for example, washed rind cheeses, and so on. But if you haven't smelled lots of cheeses, you have a broad category, which is just cheese. And so crunchy Cheetos get lumped in with a wonderful blue cheese. And so this is a way that the brain sort of um, divides the world into a kind of card catalog library system. But there's one thing that this system has. And, and so if you're an expert in smelling a particular thing, I'll just say, uh, really this set of divisions has become really nuanced. And so if, if you are an expert in, in cheeses, you have many categories of cheeses and you're distinguishing those uh, even in a pre-conscious kind of way. If you live in a rainforest, you're doing the same thing with the aromas of the rainforest. But there's one other part to this. Each experience is assigned a level of pleasurableness such that smells that are always associated with pleasurable experiences become good smells and smells associated with bad experiences become bad smells. In essence, it's like a review of the book or it's a kind of a Yelp score. And what neuroscientists think, and ecologists kind of disagree with this, which is still a little bit unclear, is that there are no in instinctively good or bad smell. Every smell ranking we have, we actually learn. Neuroscientists think that the skunk smell is, we learn that we dislike it that lavender, we learn that we like it. You might disagree with it. I don't totally agree with that, but that's our status quo understanding of the working of workings of neuroscience and smell. And so this then becomes the most ancient library we have. This is far before Alexandria. And you can imagine that this is really important as we move out across the landscape. And this system becomes important very early in life. And I'm going to quickly go through how this becomes important. And I'm going to wrap this up and so hopefully some time for questions. Uh, the way in which this begins early in life is in utero. And so what we now know is that basically any food that is smelled by the fetus when mothers are pregnant, the fetus learns that that smell is good and, and is born loving that smell. And so this has been done with experiments in France on anise. And so if mothers eat anise and their babies are presented when, when just three hours old with anise smell, they do a lick-lipping pleasure face. If the mothers did not eat anise, they do a scrunchy face displeasure face. And the same thing works for garlic, for fermented fish, for vegetables, for blue cheeses. And so you can imagine that as our ancestors went around the world, in one generation, mothers were teaching their babies what our people's food is. 
And so this is this powerful component of culinary traditions. And I'm gonna kind of close with this poem, which I think leads to the sort of some of the next parts of the book and so maybe some things we can talk about, which is that once we have these culinary traditions and once we have the power of tools, we can couple these things to make foods that we then learn to love. And so here Jane Hirschfield writes, my species, even a small purple artichoke boiled in its own bittered and darkening waters, grows tender, grows tender and sweet. Patience, I think my species keep testing the spiny leaves. What's beautiful about this poem is it reminds us that much of what we would come to learn to love to eat with our tools, eventually with fire, with fermentation, what we would learn uh, is a good smell, a good flavor, are things that without our creativity, without our tools, we're, we're actually inedible. And so with our traditions, with our tools, with our fondness for deliciousness, we would then go on to transform the world. And so that transformation is some of what the rest of the book talks about. And I'm gonna close there. Maybe we can come back to fermentation uh, a little bit later. I realize I've been talking slow because it's the end of my day. And, and, uh, and so, so I apologize that I'm running a little bit slow here, but, but I'll pause there and thank you for hanging with. No, that was fantastic. Thanks so much, Rob.